everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, welcome. Uh, this is uh, the Q&A session for the Science Communication Keynote Addresses by Ashley Landrum and Alyssa Yancey. Uh, thanks. Thanks for joining us. So because this is the first live event of the workshop on public engagement science hosted by the University of Cincinnati Center for Public Engagement Science, I also want to welcome you to the workshop. I'm Angela Potochnik, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cincinnati and Director of the Center for Public Engagement with Science. Melissa J. Cart, also a philosophy professor and Associate Director of the Center, is a primary organizer for this workshop. So if you haven't yet, please listen to Melissa's recorded video introducing the workshop, its aims, its co-sponsors, and all the people who put effort into making it happen. Uh, you can find that video on YouTube um, as well as all of the keynote addresses for the workshop. This workshop was originally scheduled to take place in person a year ago. Uh, so it's been a substantial pivot to turn it into an online event, but we're really excited about the outcome. 280 people from around the world have registered to participate and even more have been watching the fascinating talks of all of our keynote speakers on YouTube. So it's my pleasure to introduce the first two of those keynote speakers, Ashley Landrum and Alyssa Yancey, who in their recorded talk spoke on themes related to how academics can better engage in science communication. Our first speaker, Dr. Ashley Landrum, is Assistant Professor of Science Communication in the College of Media and Communication at Texas Tech University and a media psychologist. Her research investigates how values and worldviews influence people's selection and processing of science media and how these phenomena develop from childhood into adulthood. Dr. Landrum is currently working on two projects in collaboration with KQED San Francisco, funded by the National Science Foundation. These projects aim to engage younger adults with educational science media. In her keynote talk, Dr. Landrum presents research findings on how knowledge and identity intersect when it comes to accepting scientific findings. Her research challenges the knowledge deficit hypothesis, which holds that better education and scientific understanding are sufficient for increasing public acceptance of scientific consensus. According to Landrum, this deficit hypothesis only addresses the problem of knowledge it ignores how identity and trust influence acceptance of scientific findings. Drawing from data on public beliefs about vaccines and evolution, Dr. Landrum argues that identity plays an important role in acceptance or rejection of scientific findings. Her presentation concludes with a call to do more to address the multiple causes of science rejection beyond gaps in knowledge. Our second keynote speaker, Alyssa Yancey, is a longtime journalist, educator, and nonprofit leader, and a co-founder of the journalism platform, A Picture's Worth. Her writing, teaching, and consulting work aim to bridge divides by, be by building meaningful connections across differences. From translating complex scientific research to leading workshops on using journalism to elevate civil discourse and public understanding of the world, Yancey is a creative entrepreneur with a knack for solving problems and an endless fascination with people and places existing outside of traditional news cycles. In her keynote talk, The Art of Communicating Science, Yancey discusses the current state of public trust in scientific research and how scientists can use the power of story to bring their research and findings to life. Her presentation is filled with practical tips for science communication, as well as deeper context for these tips. Yancey focuses especially on the subtle but powerful ways in which features of stories can engage people from groups traditionally less welcomed in, into science, including women and people of color. Insights in Yancey's talk can help support scientists and academics at all stages of their careers as they look for ways to increase understanding of and support for their work. Okay, so for the first 30 or 40 minutes, I'm going to pose questions to Ashley Landrum and Alyssa Yancey that workshop participants have asked in advance via the workshop Slack channel. Then we're going to open up the discussion for questions posed live during this session. So if you have a question for Landrum and Yancey that you haven't asked via Slack, um, please type it into the Zoom chat feature, indicating of course who your question is directed to. I will pose those questions as well to our speakers um, in the latter half uh, of, the, of our discussion. Okay, so to begin, Lucas Dunlap asks a question that perhaps both speakers could respond to. So Lucas says, in Ashley Landrum's talk, we learned that increased scientific knowledge does correlate to acceptance among certain groups and has no impact or possibly even a negative impact among other groups. From Melissa Yancey's talk, we learned that there are strategies for engaging audiences to help with their science understanding and their science acceptance. 
But is there any information about whether the kinds of narrative strategies that Alyssa Yancey describes are effective for the groups that aren't receptive to the more traditional forms of science communication? Or are those also only effective for the groups on which the more traditional science communication approaches are also effective? So Alyssa and, and Ashley, I'll, I'll give each of you an opportunity to uh, uh, respond to that question. And I'll also add that this might be a chance to reflect more generally on anything that you see as overlaps or differences between your two talks that, that you think are, are worth mentioning. Um, so maybe we can start with Ashley. Sure. So I personally have not done work in this area where we looked at how narratives are uh, sort of differentially processed. Um, I think given what we know about how um, how people consume information generally, that that's probably still true. And it's going to be very context dependent um, and sort of how the story is presented, what the story addresses, if the story specifically, uh, I mean, basically what, what we found is that the story, that the information in the message in order to reach some of these harder to reach audiences, the information has to be designed to address their views and values. If those stories are addressed to design their views and values or what they prioritize, what they think is morally important, what they think, you know, if it's, if the story is designed that way, I think it would make that easier to, um, to move those audiences. And Alyssa, do you, would you like to, to respond? Yeah, I think that's a great question because I think it really hits to a core uh, similarity between what Ashley is talking about and what I'm talking about. And that I think is the issue that facts aren't all that matter. And what matters more than facts are faith and relationships and trust. So finding stories that connect to specific communities will resonate more with those specific communities. It sounds really obvious, but again, what is simple is not simplistic. So I think the uh, the goal of really reaching audiences who may be likely distrustful for very good reasons is to understand those reasons, to build a core, uh, core relationships with people in that audience, to come to better understand the job that we have as communicators in making sure that the facts actually can resonate beyond and inclusive of and respectful of people's belief systems and their own lived experiences that may cause them to recoil from sort of scientific uh, jargon and maybe the whole idea of research and scientific research altogether. Yeah. And to Alyssa's point, it seems simplistic, but sort of when <laughs> when something happens, like, I don't know, a pandemic, <laughs> um, we still end up seeing news organizations putting uh, public health officials or scientists up in front of the public in a mass communication way, which of course isn't necessarily like the community discussions, which are, are possibly more important, but they still put people up like Dr. Fauci or the, the oh, I forget his name, the, the man who's at Brown, University, um, where where the they end up just sort of communicating facts again, and and so the, the default is to go to, like, let me give you the facts. The facts are important, and while the facts are important, they're not really going to address the issues that um, that we see with vaccine hesitancy, with the um, the uh, hesitancy, hesitancy to wear masks in public, um, and and how uh, how that sort of plays out with some of these bigger societal issues. Yeah, and I would piggyback off that to say that because we don't have existing relationships with communities and there hasn't been a foundation of trust laid in many cases, that exacerbates the challenge of um, making facts seem uh, important, you know, over what people think, believe, and feel in their heart to be true. Yeah. We actually did um, a large data collection with KQED as part of this grant. And one of the, the um, sort of, I mean, it was just one survey question, but participants in the survey said that they trust their own guts about what um, what is credible or not credible or true or not true more than they trust um, the opinion of experts or, or others. Um, so I think that's something always to keep in mind, <laughs> you know, whether they're right or wrong, um, that's sort of the way that people are, are are thinking about and processing information. 
Well, and that whole point, sorry, I'm continuing to bounce back because <laughs> I'm so fascinated with what you're saying, Ashley. That whole point, right or wrong, isn't really as relevant to what we're talking about, right? What we're talking about is what is believed and what is acted upon, and then what becomes the basis for public opinion and public policy even. So there's a great uh, resource, and you probably are familiar with it. It's called the Ladder of Inference, and I forget which, which discipline it comes out of. It might be psychology, um, but basically the the way that the brain works to process new information and to understand the world is always based on that prior experience. So we could all look at the same picture and every single person will pick a different element of that picture out to focus on because of what we're bringing into and the lens through which we see that. So I think that whole trust your gut, what has <laughs> formed your gut right where what as i used to call it like the 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 suitcase and the luggage that you bring along with you is always there and it's neither good nor bad it just is and until and unless we recognize that and respect that um from everyone we can't really make a lot of headway in bridging um misunderstandings and actually uh addressing misinformation I have a question here. It's a great follow-up on exactly that. Um, so this is um, posed by Eduardo Martinez and, and he's asking for, um, uh, as I understand it, sort of um, specific examples of how um, the effectiveness of particular kinds of narratives uh, vary, vary with um, um, different expected or intended audiences. So he says, I would be interested to hear from Melissa Yancey about any circumstances where she faced a trade-off between narrative formats that would be more or less engaging or accessible to particular audiences and how she approached that trade-off. Are there narrative structures that might be especially engaging or especially likely to promote acceptance when a science communicator expects or intends to reach skeptical audiences or one that contests their, their expertise in particular? One example that I can point to um, sort of precedes digital age communication to an extent, but in, um, in the area where I live, which is the Cincinnati area, um, the neighborhood of Lower Price Hill is a very lively and engaged community that is overlooked by most, um, <laughs> well, it was studied a lot by researchers at the University of Cincinnati for a very long time and people who um, just by way of their own training and their own guts didn't ever I just shouldn't say absolutes, rarely shared their findings with the community. So in order to um, pinpoint the public health hazards and the environmental health hazards to that community, when the researchers came in and then left, the community members were incredibly distrustful and they were very supportive of the industries that were providing them with jobs in the neighborhood that actually happened to be major polluters and really, really bad for the environmental health in the neighborhood, um, which just happens to be sort of in a little valley for all kinds of reasons. The, the Appalachian people, um, descendants who lived in that area, I could go on and on and on. But what was really fascinating to me is that when um, a youth environmental project was launched in that community and young people were trained sort of through story to identify things like lead paint, to look at certain um, industries in their neighborhood and be able to say, oh, when that color smoke is coming out of that smokestack, that means this kind of hazardous waste is being burned. Therefore, I'm going to get my family members inside. So you make it relevant to that community. And I think that relevance comes from intimacy and understanding. So for that community, it was a newsletter. It was a public event where people could come together over a potluck and share stories. So I think it, it's, it's, it's not like in a huge, uh, is that scalable? If you look at individual communities, absolutely. But every community has its own personality. So I think, again, it's about understanding where people are coming from and what, um, and what resonates with them. Because just like the communities and people that we're trying to convince are humans just like us, right? It's not like there's some foreign creatures we have to you know, study and come up with some trick to get them in the door. We just have to care and care to find out and care to make our messages relevant to them. 
I think that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's nice to have the, the specific uh, example in play. Um, so I have a question for Ashley from what I interpret as being sort of the flip side of, of some of the themes that we've been focusing on so far around identity and connection. So Marina uh, Hubert, I'm not sure how to pronounce uh, the last name, asks, um, can we and should we really get rid of the deficit model completely in science communication? Don't we sometimes need experts to provide facts as for example, during a crisis or a pandemic? Um, right. And, no, for sure. And this is, this is sort of like my, my, what I tried to really hit in, in my talk. It's not that the knowledge deficit model is wrong. It's that it's not comprehensive. And so knowledge predicts acceptance for the most part in cases in which there's not some sort of identity, uh, protective mechanism that comes to work. For example, um, if Donald Trump didn't take the COVID-19 pandemic personally as something that he believed was going to um, uh, sort of uh, stay with or, or um, influence the way people perceived his presidency, if he had just let it be a pandemic, um, I don't, I think we would see knowledge predict behavior with wearing masks, with um, getting vaccines, et cetera. The problem was we created a politically polarized environment in which wearing a mask became a symbol of being a political conservative or not wearing a mask <laughs> became uh, an indicator of being a political uh, conservative and wearing a mask became an indicator of being politically liberal. And now you'll even see political liberals who are gonna be more hesitant to back off on certain health measures, even as the CDC says it's okay, because they feel like somehow that's, uh, like sort of catering to the to the um, to the right, who says it wasn't that big of a deal. So we politically polarize the issue. Um, I think the the other thing with knowledge knowledge deficit is just you know knowing where that endpoint starts. When somebody has no knowledge, are they sort of starting at they absolutely reject it? Are they starting at you could flip a coin either way what they believe, or they're starting at acceptance, and that's going to be contingent on the issue. So no, that the knowledge deficit model should not be completely thrown out. It's just it's too heavily relied upon, particularly by the scientific community, for for good reason. I mean, you know, you think like we create knowledge, we, you know, we put it out into the world, and we we want people to to believe it, um, and. And it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. And that's where I think sort of the principles of science and what makes science credible come into direct contrast with what's persuasive um, and how to be strategic communicators. So even with the idea of narrative, so we, we know, I mean, there's tons of literature that shows how persuasive narratives can be um, to, indi to individuals when they're designed to specific target audiences. But that totally undermines this idea that what makes science powerful is the consensus of evidence. It's not that one thing happened to one person this one time. It's that, you know, we have uh, a large, you know, 95, 90% 90 of the time, or you know, we have a large body of evidence that shows that this is the case or this is to be true. We saw them pull Johnson & Johnson off the market after set, what was it, six people out of 7.5 million had blood clots. You know, the idea of like, there's just that one narrative about that one person that had this experience just could pull people away from even being willing to get a vaccination because people can't step back and be persuaded by the larger body of evidence. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why people are, are frustrated, <laughs> particularly scientists are frustrated because they want to be able to communicate things in terms of probability. They want to be able to talk about things in terms of consensus and large bodies of evidence. But in the end, it's that single story that's persuasive and that's used as much, maybe even more so by people who are trying to undermine the uh, the scientific community with uh, vaccine hesitancy or, you know, we can even go down the, the climate change and go down the list, um, you know, more so than it's actually used by the scientists that are trying to talk about that evidence and support. I would love to, can I, can I chime in just on one thing to, to reinforce or to maybe add something to that piece that I've found in, and not, I don't have specific research, but there's a great um, documentary called Merchants of Doubt. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's about the climate crisis and the, uh, the, the tactics that are used to spread misinformation. And I can't remember the former lawmaker who is in that documentary who talks about um, the idea that 
it's a lot easier. Change is hard. People don't want to change behaviors. People don't want to do different things. People don't want to all of a sudden have to wear a mask when they haven't had to wear a mask. So if you are playing into keeping people comfortable in where they are now, as opposed to telling them what's at stake or scaring them, um, there's just a whole other layer of, of information and approach that can be informed by understanding that, yeah, people are going to grasp on to any, any story that confirms, you know, it's their confirmation bias, right? And they want to hold on to that as opposed to have to make that monumental shift of changing a behavior. I mean, we all are creatures who, you know, we don't want to change. So I think rather than expecting people to embrace change, we need to understand that change is hard and understand that change takes time and changing one's mind is a process. It's not a flip of a switch. I'm going to follow up from there by posing a couple of questions that have been asked about technique um, and focusing on the two sides of this divide about telling a story and information. So Nate Jorgensen asks, as a non-science communicator, it's a challenge to navigate the pushback from engineers and scientists on simplifying their research in a way that translates to the public. There seems to always be an issue with the amount of information in a story. It's too much. Um, it doesn't account for every exception or nuance, but it, but is easy to understand. Do you have advice for that? I'm going to ask with that at the same time um, a, a question from a different angle from Tarnay Wilkinson, uh, who says, one idea that came up uh, uh, multiple times is the idea of owning and telling one's story. But what would you say to a science communicator who isn't quite sure what their own story is yet? How would you suggest they orient themselves or try to figure out what really counts as their story? So one question about navigating the impulse to provide too much information, the other, um, a question around how, how to develop this instinct for, for one's own story. Can I jump in on the first one? Um, to start, I, I think one of the um, one of the things that that frustrates scientists is that you know from the science communication perspective, we're always saying things like don't use jargon. But I think that there's a difference. And maybe we need to be clearer about what we mean by jargon because there's a difference between jargon and being precise. And so my husband is an ant biologist. I'm using that term very broadly. <laughs> That's not quite the right way to describe him. But he, he studies a variety of different species of ants. Some of the findings that he, um, that he has are gonna apply to one or two species of ants, not ants in general. So he, in his mind, he might think when a science communicator says you need to pull back on the jargon, that that means, um, you know, don't give me the species name or don't tell me specific, but say ants, which makes him think, well, that's not accurate. So now the media is trying to get me to report things in an inaccurate way. And so I, I think in some ways, what we really mean is that we want scientists to be clear as possible. And I also think, at least um, from what I've seen in, in my area and from what I know from people who work in others, there has been a push for people, even when they're engaging in academic writing, to start trying to be a little clearer um, and to think about non-expert audiences, maybe not public, you know, public audiences, like public audiences, but just non-expert audiences when you're writing. You don't have to write in a way that's got like passive voice and it's confusing and um, you, you try try to be a bit a bit clearer, and you know, and then you know, in using jargon, where you're using a term that may not have, um, or may like even words like theory, which have a different meaning in science than they do in the general public, and just to be aware of what the public knows and thinks about your area of science, and trying to make sure you're using the language that your public will understand while still being as precise as possible. Yeah, uh, to address <laughs> Sarah's point, we don't want to use the word dumb it down because <laughs> you're not really trying to dumb it down. You're also not trying to be overly simplistic and you're not trying to be imprecise or, or inaccurate with what you're saying. You just want to be clear. Yeah, I think I would I would add to that that there is this, um, you know, I've done work with the Alba Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook, and they are wonderful at explaining how um, if you don't get someone to listen to the second sentence of your, of your findings, then, then the first and third and fifth and sixth sentences don't matter. So it really is your responsibility. And I said this in my talk to, to find a, an entry point. And that entry point doesn't have to be wrong, 
It should be clear. It should be compelling. It could be about your process or what inspires you to do the work that you do? I mean, there's a great question I used to always ask my students at the end of every semester. I'd be like, why do you do what you do in a word? And you just really start to get to the heart of of what motivates people. And when you can tap into motivation, then you tap into passion. When you tap into passion, you get people interested. And when you get people interested, they're more open to be educated. And they're more likely to actually hear a deeper story than if you are right off the bat speaking in big generalities because we we are smart people we and and one one area of expertise that could be in the same field as another they could speak completely different languages i saw that all the time when i was working in the um, college of environmental health and it was very fascinating to me and i think the other the other thing at play here is the more you go to school the more you learn the more you're rewarded for sounding smart and the more everyone wants to be caught up in that, like, uh, my, my work is so complicated, only I can understand it. So there's a real push and pull between people who are like, well, if you want to get tenure, you've got to be this. And if you actually want to make an impact, you've got to do something completely opposite. And I don't think you have to live in that world. I think you can be, as Ashley was saying, clarity is critical. But, you know, you can also be human. And I think there's also a really compelling case to be made for regularly interacting with people who aren't scientists. I think that keeps and helps ground everyone in their work is to be friends with people who aren't in your field because they often have points that can help you do better work. And I think that helps everyone um, in the long run. And we regularly crack down on master's and PhD students for trying to write to sound smart. So I, I do think there's a right. way to get that, <laughs> you know, that they may have been something that was really, you know, popular decades ago. And, and I think there's a shift to try to get rid of that, that, you know, you don't sound smart. You just sound like you have no idea what you're talking about. So you've used a thesaurus just to put word salad in a paper. So I'm realizing that I'm not going to be able to pose all of their great questions that were asked ahead of time by Slack. We have about 10 more minutes or so um, before we'll move towards um, open question, open Q&A of things that have been asked in the chat. Um, but I'm going to sneak in as, or fit in as many questions as I can. So apologies to those who, who I'm not um, getting to your questions. Uh, so from there, I think it's a nice, nice question um, uh, from the conversation you all were just having. Kevin Elliott would like to hear Alyssa's thoughts on how scientists can partner with other organizations or individuals to communicate their work. So he says, I've been curious whether we might promote much more effective science communication if we focus more on creating partnerships between scientists and vari various NGOs or other institutions that specialize in communicating science, science to particular audiences, rather than placing the onus on scientists themselves to become better communicators. Actually, this question, when I saw it, was one of the ones that inspired me to put together a sheet of resources um, of places that... Uh, where scientists can go to look for partnerships. And I think for me, no matter what field you're in, collaboration makes everything better. Um, and I think collaborating across disciplines, again, makes everything better. Specifically, there's a, if, if you're in the Cincinnati area, I know this is a global audience, but I'm sure many uh, communities have similar groups. There's an organization called Green Umbrella. Green Umbrella has all kinds of different channels and um, working groups that are doing working on everything from activism to policy to education. And that's a perfect example of a place where the person who's the director of community outreach is a University of Cincinnati alumna, one of my former students, as a matter of fact. And, um, and I think there's such a great opportunity to not only find out what kinds of information might help inform your research and your findings and maybe future areas of study, but also ways to re-energize yourself and get really community buy-in and community interest in your work, which is, you know, just, it feels good, but it also is good. And there's a, I don't know if Amy Townsend Small is an audience today, but she just did an amazing partnership with Grist, which is a um, environmental news organization, uh, nonprofit, grist.org. And it was uh, 
I think the Pulitzer Center even helped fund some of the reporting on it. It was an <clears throat> it was amazing storytelling that came out of really hardcore research into uh, abandoned uh, fracking sites and methane leakage and the damage that's causing to the environment. So there are lots of different ways to do it. Lots of, I mean, everything from AAAS to the Alda Center, there's a million different resources. And I'm sure even through um, the UC Center for the, the Pews, <laughs> you, you also do this work. So it's important to tap into existing resources because you don't have to make this stuff stuff up out of whole cloth. You don't have to chart your own path out of whole cloth. There are people out there hungry for um, for partnerships and for relationship building, but don't go in it for the short term, really go in it and be open and honest and be transparent about your motivations because community people will see right through you. And the universities of the world have done a lot of harm. And I think the very first thing I ask before I do any story or anything is, am I doing no harm or am I participating in the continuation of a cycle of use and um, discarding uh, people. And that's not okay. Thank you. Um, okay, now I have a question about disagreement or dissent um, and our two versions uh, of, of related questions. And I'm going to pose one to Ashley and one to Alyssa. So of Ashley, Nate Jorgensen asks, does the existence of an industry that markets against science cause a greater difference in public versus scientist held beliefs? So for example, does the whole foods industry uh, cause, uh, with quotes around whole foods, um, cause more of a difference uh, than there would be without a money-making opposition to the safety of GMO foods? I mean, probably. <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, so I haven't done research in that specific area, but, you know, we, if we go back and look at communication theory, like, you know, the ideas that things are cultivated or normalized. Um, one thing that I, I'd say about a lot of these, um, uh, I, well, I can't remember exactly how, how it was phrased in the question, but these sort of groups that go against science in, in some, some ways, they really rely a lot on, uh, like a light conspiracy theorizing, um, in that the there's this idea that you know scientists and or other large corporations are somehow um, making more money off of um, off of the opposite of whatever they're doing, right? So with, with Whole Foods, you know, uh, you know, scientists are are letting agricultural you know, agricultural conglomerates like Monsanto make a ton of money off of poisoning our youth, um, which you know, I mean, if you yeah, I mean, if you drink glyphosate, you're probably not going to survive. But you know, you have a little bit of an honor to it. But yeah, I, I think the um, those you know, yeah, Lee um, Lee McIntyre, who who's on this call too, has a lot to say about this. Um, I will kick his book out here. It's called How to Talk to a Science Denier, <laughs> and that'll be coming out soon. Um, and and you know, he he addresses a, a lot of this as well. The you know, the other thing I think that so I've talked several times to um, what the Mark Sargent, who calls himself the mayor of flat earth about a variety of different conspiracies. Um, one being, you know, this idea of GMO. And I said, well, when you have two competing organizations that both make money off of their narratives, how do you know which one is the, is, is the, is the evil guy, right? Is that, um, you know, is it Monsanto who is, um, you know, creating these, these products. And, and I gave the example of, you know, trying to help, you know, farmers save their crops from pesticides or, you know, or on the other hand, is it um, groups like, um, you know, Whole Foods or, or like the wellness, health and wellness market that will like, I think my sister sent me a picture from Walmart where they had like um, mint plants marked as non-GMO, like non-GMO mint plants. And it was like $2 extra than the other mint plants that weren't marketed that way. Guess what? There's no genetically modified version of a mint plant. So of course it's like, they're both non-GMO, um, but you know, it ends up being used as a marketing tactic. And, you know, there's, there's research that says even putting those labels on things. So, you know, labeling something as non-GMO makes people think GMO is some sort of ingredient that is inherently dangerous. 
and when I wrote a paper on public perception of GM technology, there was a, a biotechnologist who wrote a five page response to my review talking about um, how, uh, how there's no such thing as GMOs. Like conceptually, that would be like calling everything you put in an oven to cook a bakey. You know, let's call everything a bakey. Well, that doesn't make any sense because we put so many different things in an oven and we use, there's different temperatures and different products. And they said, well, like that's the same thing with GM. Like, why are you trying to call it one thing? And I said, well, I'm not trying to. <laughs> it's like, it's a, there's a public concept of it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm sure having these, um, you know, organizations out there trying to use these things as marketing ploys, whether purposely or, you know, incidentally end up increasing public skepticism of science when science is saying something safe and you know whole food says spend five more dollars to to get a not, <laughs> not version like that so here's a related question for Alyssa um asking about disagreement among scientists so kevin elliott uh, asks um or says i'm really interested in uh, areas of scientific disagreement where different community scientists hold different views about an issue. So for example, maybe endocrine disrupting chemicals where there have been bitter disagreements over the extent to which these chemicals pose hazards at very low dose levels. Do you have thoughts on how scientists could use your recommended storytelling approach to talk about these kinds of disagreements um, and the factors that cause them to, to disagree that gets beyond a kind of good side, bad side framing? Right, and I think, I'm. I'm glad that is the question because it helps me reflect back on what I was thinking as Ashley was talking, um, which is this whole idea of nuance, right? Nuance is hard. Complexities are hard. So the whole idea of narratives being these simple straight through lines where there is either a good or a bad, we need to really work to deconstruct that. And I think, you know, respectful conversations, but even showing like very different um, narratives side by side and comparing them and then engaging in conversations about them that really key into the fact that, yeah, it's OK to not necessarily I mean, not everybody's 100 percent this uh like with say endocrine disruptors is a great example. I remember, gosh, it was probably at least a decade ago, I went to a symposium offered by environmental journalism organization about endocrine disruptors. And that was at a time when there had been a big news, uh, news story about, you know, this is horrible, everything's bad, we should be terrified, right? And there were some scientists also at this symposium who, who offered, you know, a, a sort of broadened perspective. And I think the key there, though, is making sure that you start the conversation um, and get people into the room to have that like virtual room, whatever kind of room, right? Into a space where they can hold that. Not everything's a simple right or wrong. And that nuance and complexity are good things. That means people are, are questioning. That means people are trying to understand more. And that's the whole idea about science too, right? There's never like this, and that's where people get into trouble, right? We always need to do more studies. We can always learn more. We can always ask more questions. So I think you have to kind of gradually introduce that space where you say, and again, this comes straight from the Alda Center. This is a really simple, like a simple story about this topic. It's a lot more complicated. I can tell you more about it, but until I get that simple, until I've hooked you, you're not going to hear the complications. You're not going to hear the, the nuance. You're not going to pay any attention to that. And I think when that happens, which happens all the time, 24 seven news cycle, thank you very much. Right. We all lose out because we don't, um, we don't question our own belief systems, which then perpetuates the same cycle. So it doesn't happen enough, but I think. Um, there's reasons why it doesn't happen, but when it does, it's really, it's really awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a really, one really specific question for Ashley about some of the research she was discussing from Dan Hicks, and then we're going to move to open Q&A. Um, so Dan was interested in the COVID mask results near the end of your presentation. They say, um, it seems like this was a pre-post within subject study, study design, but then the graph just shows group means. And so they're really interested to know um, what the pre-post difference is, um, if those are available and what those looked like for each sub subject. Yeah, so we we did both. Um, so we had a we used something called a Solomon group design, 
where we looked at, um, we had a sample that was, people were randomly assigned to get a pretest or not. And then um, both groups got a post-test, but half, half of one group got the experimental treatment, the other half got control. And then in the post only half got experimental, half got control. So when we presented the results, because there wasn't an effective pre-sensitization, um, there wasn't an effect of that. We just looked at the between group differences. Um, yes, there are, um, we do have the, the means for that. I think what I would recommend is to s send me an email <laughs> and I can send you the paper, which is under review. Um, and that'll have all of the, all of the stuff in it. I don't have that to pull up quite easily right, right now. Okay. Um, so a question from Diana, um, but Bedoya or Bedoya, Bedoya, I believe, believe, um, thank you for the talks. I've, I have some questions for you both. Um, I still struggle to understand how storytelling is not in adherence to the deficit model. If scientists are in front of an audience without knowing more about them and start talking about their story, their research, even if it's interesting or human or personal, how is that bi-directional communication if scientists are just talking and not listening? If we keep assuming that our goals of communication should matter for people without knowing their concerns or needs, we just focus on crafting a perfect story without jargon, then how is that different from one-way communication? How can storytelling work without creating a dialogue? Yeah, so I just want to make a quick distinction here. So knowledge deficit is sort of one model under the one-way sort of model of communication. So knowledge deficit is really focused just on sharing facts, not necessarily on storytelling or, or something like that. Um, but you're totally right. I think that uh, anytime you have mass communication, so somebody who is just talking at an audience instead of talking with an audience, that is one-way communication and not that bi-directional engagement. I actually reviewed a paper um, the other day that, that was talking about public engagement with science and some of the, um, the measures it was using was things like, you know, they were trying to say like, how much is the how much is the public engaged with science? And they're saying things like, are you reading newspapers? Are you watching news coverage? Well, that's all, that's not really engagement, right? That's just consumption. Um, so I just wanted to make that distinguish between knowledge deficit one way and two way or multi-way. And what I would say to that is storytelling is in of itself, it's, it's a communal practice, but it is a it is one way, right? You're telling a story. So you can tell a story for all kinds of reasons. So you can tell a story to engage a community. A lot of times what I'll do, and I think one way to, and it depends on the format, like sometimes there just is no, there is no back and forth. But if you know, if you have a target within your general audience, you can, you can tailor what you're talking about to that audience. So, and that, and, and honestly, there are, there are talks and stories I've listened to where I have absolutely no interest in the topic at all, but the person's story is so compelling, I'll listen to it anyway. So number one, there's that. And I think otherwise, like when I would train at different colleges and I was trying to train these different college media outlets to look at their coverage through a more community focused lens. So for every school I went to, I changed my content. I used their information. So I think you can do some homework if you're talking to an audience of K through 12, if you're talking to an audience of uh, philosophy majors, if you're talking to an audience of community members, you can switch out. I mean, I have specific portions of, of ways that I have to communicate specific topics, right? And I will switch out different portions depending on who I'm, who I'm addressing and what my purpose is, what my goal is, and how I can try my best, in the, if possible, to follow up and see how that engagement either went or might lead to future conversations. Thank you. Um, so another question from Paul Franco. Um, if identity influences acceptance, does who is delivering the message also matter? So for example, if the right Republican, so someone not like likely to lab be labeled a Republican in name only, uh, were to express acceptance of climate change, might that make a difference to acceptance among Republicans? Is this a way that trust might actually interact with knowledge and identity? So I, I was just answering this question for Paul in the chat because I wasn't sure if you were gonna read it because you went past it. But um, uh, basically, uh, possibly, but likely no. Um, so one of the, one of the issues is that credibility 
um, and identity aren't something that are fixed in the mind of an audience. So sometimes by siding with a, with another side, you you can actually lose your credibility or lose your standing. In fact, that's where that name, you know, Republican in name only or Democrat in name only comes from, is the minute that somebody sort of switches to say, well, look, this is what the evidence says. I'm going to have to kind of side here. Then the 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 plebeians come out with their torches and start calling you a, a such and such in name only. Um, I had a paper where we show this with Pope Francis talking about you know the issue of climate change. Change. And there was a lot of hope among, you know, uh, about climate change advocates, you know, people like Catherine Hayhoe, uh, Barack Obama, you know, people were saying like, look, here you have a, a socially conservative church. You have the head of that church, Pope Francis, coming out and saying that, that, you know, their, their followers have a, um, you know, have a, have a moral obligation to act to address climate change. And instead what you get is, well, he's not the real Pope Benedict was, he didn't die first, <laughs> right? So you start having these like justifications for why you shouldn't have to, to believe that person or, well, the Pope should stay out of politics um, and just stick to issues re related to religion. Um, and, and so I, it really depends, I, I think on, um, you know, on, on who that community member is. And honestly, I, I think it's, it would, it's going to have to be a large proportion of those numbers and not just a one, a one person switching sides, but like a, a sort of a gradual shift. And, and again, I'll, I'll say, and maybe this goes back to the idea of, you know, we should rely less on top down communication and more on ground up that, you know, these politicians and these communicators, these, they call them opinion leaders, but Sometimes they're really just sort of representative of the people that they're speaking for. And so as the constituents start to move, we can hope that the, the politicians themselves start to shift. But we often do see the people shift first before we see the, the heads, heads doing so, because there are going to be likely victims to criticism um, from, from the louder, even if smaller samples of their uh, supporters. I just wanted to add, I take that from a completely different perspective, right? Because what I typed was representation matters. Because to me, if you have a community member who is um, who is sort of your trusted, who trusts you as a scientist and can introduce you to that community, if you have a person of color, if you have a person who is representative of whatever different group that might be saying there, that there might be some pushback against, then of course it makes a difference because you're seeing you're seeing someone who you can relate to more closely. So this isn't on like the major leader type scale, but I think we do a disservice to communities by not featuring their voice and lifting up that voice as the most important in the room because they are the ones who are living oftentimes and facing the um, the impact of things like climate change and environmental but, injustice, right? But again, I think it really has to come from that community within yes. that community and not as a top down voice. Exactly. So it's not going to be like CNN finding, you know, uh, a rural African-American doctor to try to speak to vaccine hesitancy. It's going to be um, you know, public interest groups going into those rural communities, giving those doctors resources to talk to in their communities. Um, because people are going to trust or listen to uh, people they know personally, and exactly. they'll they'll just come come after um, like Lynn Cheney, <laughs> you know, voted for voted for impeachment, and now all of a sudden she might as well be liberal in in the in the minds of the um, you know of her followers in her own state, and so it you know it, it it's really got to be I, I think very localized. Um, and people you know personally who can change your change your views and not like a messenger from the top, at least not for these politically loaded or, or controversial issues. I mean, you can find somebody who is um, is is representative of communities or is an opinion leader who can get you to buy shoes or makeup. Um, but that you know, changing your mind on climate change or <laughs> voting for certain propositions or um, you know, that's that's going to be a bit a bit a bit harder. Thank you both. That was a really fascinating sort of um, interplay of ideas to have to have kind of unspool uh, and connect. Um, so I have a question from Chris Rickles for Ashley um, and thinking about the evolution findings in particular where the acceptance of evolution can be decom decomposed into different kinds. Um, so two questions. Um, 
He says, I think this finding directs us to rethink our assessment strategies for public understanding of science, right? So rather than an item by item inventory of knowledge, understanding seems to be much more nuanced. We have to consider how individuals construct their understanding. Are there existing models of this kind of assessment? Second question, um, do you think the evolution finding directs us to structure informal and formal science learning opportunities to be more open to what some call non-scientific discourse? What I mean is that we science communication people should be open to giving explanations that deploy anthropomorphic or teleological concepts, for example, since these resonate better with someone who sees divine intervention as real, um, or does doing something like that corrode scientific understanding? So I think this is, again, one of those cases where it really just depends on what your goal is. Um, and we, so I have a paper that we actually published in Trends in Biotechnology, but because it, it was in response to a, a commentary on GMOs saying, if you just explain the science of GM, people will accept it. And we're like, okay, hold on. <laughs> um, and one of the things that, that, that we say is you really have to know as a communicator, whether you're a scientist communicating your own findings, or if you're trying to go to a public forum to work with the population, you really just have to say, okay, what is my goal? And is, is your goal to get people to say evolution is real? <laughs> is your goal to get people to understand what the process of evolution is, like what that what that theory describes? Um, or, you know, what what is your goal? Because the ways in which you go to approach that may have conflicting outcomes. Um, so yes, you could you might be able to um, to use a um, a sort of intuitive theory or or you know, anthropomorphize something. People anthropomorph. So here's a great example: vaccination, right? People have used this metaphor of an army, right? So like uh, you're you're immunizing, you're deploying this army, and it has negative consequences too, because then people think, oh well, you have this stuff that's like external to my body that you're putting in that's like fighting things, you know, And and so there's always going to be kind of like negatives associated with it. But you have to say, well, what is my goal, and which sort of method or what strategy of communication is really going to meet that goal. And, and we don't always know the answer to that. And, you know, there's constantly research going on to figure out what the best way to persuade people or to educate people about some of these different, different topics are. But we also, I think, don't always really admit to ourselves what our goals are. Um, and one of the disagreements, and I think Melissa might have even witnessed this, that Michael Weisberg and I have constantly argued about is does it matter if you get a person to say, I believe evolution is real? Like, does it matter to society? Um, and, you know, does it matter if, if they're willing to say, well, micro evolution is a thing, but not macro. And when we know that they're not scientifically different, <laughs> if you believe in micro evolution, macro evolution is micro evolution on a really big time scale. So, but if you can at least get people's foot in the door, right? To understand the principles, then hopefully they have some sort of schema for understanding things about like virus mutations. Um, you know, because in the end, like, you know, aside from voting on the school board to try to get evolution not taught in schools, you know, it, to their everyday life, it's really not going to be meaningful to them. If they will accept micro evolution and listen to, to, to you know, if, if your goal is just to get them to understand those principles, then sometimes you have to spoonful sugar it, <laughs> you know, to, to find a way to make it palatable for people. And, and I, yeah, I, so I do think, I think that's tough because sometimes you have to like give up, um, on what you're, what you would really like <laughs> for what your really specific goal is. Thank you. So I'm sorry to say this is going to be the last question I'm going to be able to um, pose to you all, but we will save the chat. And, and as I've already said, also conversation can continue in the Slack channel dedicated to, to, this, to this discussion. Um, so this question is from Aryans uh, Palayo. Um, I have a more general question. This is for Alyssa um, uh, regarding science communication. Are there any initiatives or websites for helping non-English speakers in particular engage with basic science? Many immigrants come to the US with sometimes nothing more than elementary education. Sometimes they wish to get a GED. There is a Spanish GED science option. Um, um, I'm not sure about other languages, um, but it's unclear what other resources apart from teachers are available to them. Offhand, I mean, I have people I can ask that question to because I know that there are people really interested, especially in environmental education and environmental science in this, in that with those communities, um, immigrant communities in particular. So 
um, I actually messaged, I said, I will be happy to uh, look some stuff up and, and contact some folks and put it in the Slack. Thank you. That's great. Um, so it's also another good plug for, for, as I said, continuing this conversation in our Slack channel. Um, and, and our hope is that we sort of are able to collectively kind of develop a, a repository of resources that will be useful for, for people from different perspectives who've come to this conversation. Um, so let me thank, um, for I know everyone in our in our audience, um, Ashley Landrum and Alyssa Yancey, once again, for your really um, uh, insightful and inspiring keynote talks. And then this also really fascinating discussion and exchange between the two of you. Um, it's really been fun. Uh, for anyone who, um, wants more of this, we are also posting a recording of this Q&A discussion um, eventually up on YouTube. And, um, and then of course, remember also to, to show up for our next uh, live workshop event, which will start in, in just 15 minutes. Uh, so a little bit of a chance for a break. And that will be a um, panel discussion among additional experts um, from a variety of different uh, institutional backgrounds and contexts. Um, discussing science communication and continuing discussion about science communication, our first of four themes for this workshop in particular. Um, so thanks again, Alyssa and Ashley, and thanks everyone else for joining us. Um, see, see everyone soon. Thank you so much.